Well, I'm glad you've joined us tonight. We're going to take a look at some things in the Word of God tonight related to being a missionary. Uh, but before we come to this, we need to uh, prepare ourselves, make sure that uh, we're in right relationship with God. And uh, while you're praying, uh, remember to pray also for Pastor Dean and those traveling with him. The report is he's having a wonderful time in Africa. And <clears throat> we need to remember also to pray for the upcoming evangelism experience that I hope all of you are going to participate in at the county fair this weekend and the following weekend. So um, let's pray. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, that we can come together and we can open your word and we can see the things that you have planned for us and provided for us. We thank you that you provided all things necessary for life, for godliness, all things necessary to fulfill your purpose. And we give thanks that we do have a purpose in this life because you have plan for each one of us to have ministry and to serve you. We thank you that you've given us gifts so that we have abilities to fulfill your purpose. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who indwells us to empower us so that we can use those gifts so that we can glorify you through them. We do pray for Robbie and Pam, Kim, Linda, you're going to Watch over and keep them safe, and you're going to keep them in health while they're gone. Bring them safely back. We pray that uh, even now you're going to be preparing the way for the evangelism project at the fair this weekend. I pray that many people will join uh, those who are coming to share the gospel. And uh, they're going to be uh, able and willing tell others how they can come to faith in Jesus Christ, and I pray even now you would be preparing people to come to that fair who need to hear this message, and that you'll bring them to the booth so that uh, they can have a hearing, they can get uh, the gospel, get a straight gospel, and know what they need to do to have eternal life. I thank you now that we have your word before us. We pray that your Holy Spirit will give us enlightenment. We might have a better understanding of how you're working in the world and what our role in it uh, is. So we pray that the Spirit now will guide us into truth. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we want to uh, uh, look at some things tonight. Uh, last, last time we went quickly through the book of Acts, which is the beginning of the church, and also the beginning of missionary activity for the church. And we saw that there is now an emphasis on missionary activity to a much greater degree than what was seen in the Old Testament. There's more emphasis uh, laid on it, and uh, now the church which is universal, the church which is around the world, has the responsibility of uh, giving the gospel message and teaching others about the plan of God. So we won't uh, go through all of these, but uh, if you want them, they'll be up on the website uh, so you can see how missions developed in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, we have the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, but there were Jews from all over the Roman Empire. Uh, they had been scattered for various reasons, but uh, thousands of them came to Jerusalem to observe feast days in the spring of the year. And many of these Jews who came from 17, 18 other countries uh, they grew up in those foreign countries, and they no longer spoke Hebrew. They didn't speak Aramaic. They spoke Gentile languages. 
And so in uh, the very beginning, these people are going to be evangelized in their own language, in their own dialect, through the miraculous gift of tongues. Of course, this is a, uh, had a twofold purpose. One was to give a warning to Israel that the judgment of God had come upon the nation, uh, just as was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 28. When you hear the gospel in Gentile languages, know that judgment has come upon the nation. The other reason <clears throat> that the people were being evangelized in all of these different Gentile languages was to give them the gospel so that the cursing could be turned to blessing as they responded to the gospel. But we see immediately at the beginning of the church, God is spreading this message out and so thousands of people were saved as they heard the gospel message in their own language and also through the great preaching of Peter on that day. And then after the feast days were accomplished, these people went back to their own country. But we don't have any record of them doing evangelism once they got home. Perhaps they did, but we have no account that there was uh, the preaching of the gospel in those many places. Then in Acts chapter 8, we have uh, the gospel being taken to the Samaritans, uh, and these were uh, kind of a mixed breed people, and uh, they were many of them part Jew, part Gentile, as far as their lineage is concerned. And these people heard the gospel, they were saved, and of course for the pure Jews down in Jerusalem, they're a little suspicious, so they sent apostles up to verify the fact that these people had been saved. Also, we have the salvation of the Ethiopian eunuch. He was a proselyte. Uh, physically, he was a Gentile, but religiously, he was Jewish, but he came to faith in Christ as <clears throat> Philip explained to him how the Messiah of the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 53 was indeed Jesus uh, who had died for the sins of the world. And he is probably the founder of the church in Ethiopia. In Acts chapter 10, we have Cornelius. He is a Gentile. He was a Roman soldier, a centurion. And uh, Peter went to the house of this Gentile, gave them the gospel, and Cornelius and his household all put faith in Jesus Christ. And so it was stated, God has opened the door for the Gentiles to be saved. Then in Acts 11, 12, 13, we have things that are moving now up to the church in Antioch, Antioch here being in Syria, and uh, a church has been founded there, and this is an amazing church. <clears throat> it was started because there had been persecution, Some people had gone up there, church got started, and uh, they began taking in Gentiles. So you have Jews and Gentiles. You have a mixed congregation. Um, and so people are being saved there. And uh, it's the uh, first missionary sending church in Acts 13. Uh, we'll take a look at uh, this passage in a little while. Uh, Paul and Barnabas, uh, two of the leaders in that church, they are sent out from the church, and they become the first cross-cultural missionaries sent out by a local church, and that's the beginning of the missionary journeys of Paul, as recorded in the book of Acts. In uh, Acts 13, um, verse 14 down through uh, verse 43, you have Gentiles converted, you have a synagogue at another Antioch. It gets confusing when you see Antioch. You always have to look at the context to find out what Antioch are we talking about? Would you believe that there were some 15 cities named Antioch? They were named after Antiochus, and so this was a, a very popular thing to name people, <coughs> name cities after the Roman leader. And so uh, the, Paul ended up going to the synagogue in um, Pisidian Antioch, which is up in Turkey. 
and this becomes the bridgehead uh, for ministry in the Gentile world. Um, then you have idolatrous pagans that are converted. Here you have people who um, are worshiping false gods. These are in the area of Turkey. This is Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, uh, Iconium, cities called Lystra and Derbe. And uh, Gentile churches now are planted, and they are going to be purely Gentiles. Then uh, in Jerus Acts 15, you have the uh, first big church fight that is recorded, a uh, huge debate in the Jerusalem church, and uh, there is then official recognition that Gentiles are being saved in the same way that Jews are saved, and that's by faith in Jesus Christ. And then in Acts 16 through the end of the book, you have two more missionary journeys by the Apostle Paul, and then how Paul is arrested, ends up in the city of Rome. And so uh, what we see is uh, the gospel spreading to Greece, and then it's going to go on to Rome, which is going to be the political capital uh, of the world. Now, I want to talk tonight about how we go from the general idea of a commission which is given to the corporate church to individuals. How do you become a missionary? Well, there's something very mysterious that seems to float around in many churches, uh, something that I've heard about since I was a child, and that's the missionary call. Now, this is a very mysterious topic. And you can go online and you can look for missionary call, and you, you will find a lot of different things there. Some of them are very mystical, very mysterious. Some of them are, are, are trying to explain how you can have this call upon your life or how you can recognize it or what you can do to achieve it. There was a, a very well-known uh, professor at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School up north of Chicago. He was pres professor of the School of World Missions and Evangelism. Uh, <clears throat> he had been director of missions in other Bible colleges before that. And he said this, the term missionary call should never have been coined. It's not scriptural and therefore can be harmful. Thousands of youth desiring to serve the Lord have waited and waited for some mysterious missionary call that never come. People are waiting. Oh, there's a missionary call. Well, you know, I had my phone turned off or somehow I, I, I was sleeping. I didn't get that message from God. And so I guess he doesn't want me to be a missionary because I didn't get... Uh, the, the, the tingles in the middle of the night, or uh, I didn't have this mysterious vision, I didn't have any voice in my ear. I can tell you, Phyllis and I have heard a lot of stories about people who got a missionary call, and some of them really are bizarre. Uh, we, we had friends in Ukraine, husband and wife, and they had uh, gone to Ukraine on a, on a short-term trip. They'd gone over for a few weeks. And as it turned out, they each took a separate airplane to fly back to the States. And um, then when they got to the States, they each had this story that they had to tell the other as soon as they got off the airplane. And so he says, there I was, I was at 38,000 feet. And God said to me, you need to go back to Ukraine. And there his wife was. She told the story. There I was at 39,000 feet, and God spoke to me, and God said, you need to be a missionary in Ukraine. And then they got off the plane, separate planes, and they got together, and they said, you know, he was at 947, and God spoke to me. Oh, I had the same thing happen. I mean, this is strange stuff. And um, so they, they knew that they were supposed to go uh, to Ukraine to be missionaries. Then we had another couple that uh, came to Ukraine, 
And they said, God has called us to be missionaries in Ukraine. And uh, they said, well, the first thing we need to do is to do language study. And so they began to study the language. And then they, uh, they, they didn't know what they were supposed to be doing. And I said, look, I, I can give you some work. I can, I can plug you in. I can give you some Bible classes to teach. I can uh, open up some doors for you to go do evangelistic work. Well, no, we're, we're not going to do that yet. Uh, we're, we're, ju we're just going to be here. We're going to get acclimated, which is okay. But then after eight months of just taking language classes, he came and said, well, we're going to return to the States. I mean, it was kind of strange. They'd sold their house and everything to come to Ukraine because God had called them. And then after eight months, he said, well, we're going to go back to the States. And I said, what are you going to do? He said, I don't know. He said, and whatever God wanted us to learn here in Ukraine, we've learned it. And so now we're going home. Uh, and I just thought, I don't really know that God called them to come to Ukraine because they didn't do any ministry. And uh, so I just thought it was a very curious um, situation. So we've heard others that they, they talk about, they get a feeling, they, they somehow sense that God wanted them to go. And some people think that God has called them to a particular place. God called me to go to China. God called me to go to Africa. And uh, they, they have these stories. They say, well, how do you know? Oh, I just know. Well, that's mysticism. And there's nothing biblical about it. And so you, you talk to different people or you read articles, you read books about missions, and there, there's little agreement as to what actually constitute a call to the mission field. They don't know how to define it, um, but it used to be that if you're going to be a missionary, you definitely had to have a call. And uh, they couldn't define it, but they knew it if they had it. And um, th th many years ago, there was a mission agency in Central America. They were looking for uh, some people to come and to work with them. And so I, I wrote a letter and I volunteered, said I would, I would be glad to come for a year and, and help out. And uh, I got a very nasty letter back. Oh, no, no. We, we, we're looking for people who have the call and we are looking for people who want to make a lifetime commitment. We, we don't want dilettantes to come and uh, now these same mission agencies today, they are desperate for people, and they would be glad for somebody to come for a year or two. But uh, uh, at that time, they're saying, no, we, uh, you have to have the call, and you, you, don't, you don't have any call. So they wouldn't uh, consider me to be a missionary. Uh, uh, there was a, <clears throat> a man by the name of Harold Cook, he used to be prep professor of missions at Moody Bible Institute, and he wrote a book. He started teaching missions about 1950, and, and there was no book on missions that he could use for his class. So he just started teaching, and then he developed his course, and he developed his lectures, and finally wrote a book uh, in introduction to uh, Christian missions. And when that book came out, it became the standard text for Bible schools and seminaries all across America because there wasn't anything like it in print. And he um, laid down the biblical basis for missions and then he started giving practical uh, ideas and approaches for uh, mission work. And uh, this was something that was very positive for students as well as for pastors and, and churches. And so... Um, he said this, though, about the missionary call. To sum up, one, a special divine call is not necessary to witness for Christ beyond the national border. Two, the striking vision that Paul received at Troas, the so-called Macedonian call, was not his missionary call, nor is it typical of such a call. And three, the call to missionary service 
is not necessarily associated with a definite field at home or abroad. It might seem from this that we have completely ruled out the idea of a call, but that's not so. And uh, later he goes on to say, uh, sometimes in order to see the matter in its proper relationship, we might well do to drop the word call and instead speak of a matter of guidance. Well, when you come to divine guidance, that is also a rather slippery slope, and a lot of people have really gotten tangled up when they are trying to figure out, how do I know the will of God, which is what the missionary call is. How do I know his will uh, with regard to my going to the mission field? Um, but then Cook went on to give examples of uh, seven great missionaries. And he talked about how they got to the mission field and how, how they uh, were motivated to become missionaries. And he says there's no pattern. There's nothing definite that we can uh, latch on to when we read about these different people because they all got there uh, in different ways with different motivations. So what is this call? And I... I think it's important for us to understand this because even though uh, Cook wrote this book back in 1954 and um, even though uh, Cain uh, wrote his book many, many years ago saying there's not a definite missionary call, it's still being touted today in some circles and many people have this idea that you've got to have some special insight or get some special notice from God if you're going to be a missionary. Of course, experience should never be the criterion by which we evaluate the validity of any spiritual truth. We always have to go back to our sufficient source and authority, which is the Bible. Now, the major usage of the word call in the New Testament is the call to salvation. And it would seem that the Apostle Paul used the word as a kind of a comprehensive term to encompass all that pertains to our conversion to Christ, which is hearing the gospel, believing the gospel, and then all of the consequences that come from the new birth, such as union with Christ and spiritual gifts, commands for the Christian life, and so on. All of these can uh, be found relative to this term for call. Now, Paul did use this term in connection with his call to apostleship. In Romans 1.1, 1, 1, 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, he said, I was called an apostle, or called to be an apostle, is the way it gets translated. Uh, but we don't find any clear reference anywhere in Scripture to a missionary call. Now, there are two passages that get associated with this idea of a missionary call. Uh, one is found in Acts chapter 13. Okay, in verse 1, the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, and then he lists the teachers and prophets. Two, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Now, this was not a separate and distinct call to missionary service. In one sense, Saul and Barnabas are already functioning somewhat as missionaries. They're working among Gentiles. They're in that church in Antioch because they had Gentiles in that church, and Saul and Barnabas would be working among them. But the Holy Spirit here is going to somehow communicate to them that they need to become cross-cultural missionaries in foreign lands. And, uh, but we don't find that this is a missionary call as such, although some say, oh, the Holy Spirit said... Well, how did the Holy Spirit say this? Did he speak to the leaders of the church in an audible voice? We don't know. Perhaps it was Luke who wrote this uh, book of Acts later just saying in some way they knew that this is what they needed to do, that uh, 
uh, people recognized something in Saul and Barnabas that said, you, you really ought to take this message out to other people. You work so well with these Gentiles, why don't you go do it at Cyprus or in Turkey or some other place? We don't know how the Holy Spirit actually spoke to them. But we do know that the church leaders in Antioch recognized something about these men, and they also prayed about this, and then they acknowledged that these men can represent the church. So Paul and Barnabas will go out as representatives of the church at Antioch. That's the laying on of hands. And so it says they sent them away. And then it says, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit. Well, who sent them out, the Holy Spirit or the church? Well, it would appear that both did. And I, I think that there needs to be now, the person, the individual has to recognize, I want to go serve the Lord in this way in another place. And I think also that it's important that there be those in the church who recognize these are people that uh, can serve the Lord, and we are willing to identify with them as they go. There are those who go out as rogue missionaries. They have... Uh, no one to whom they are accountable, and sometimes they go out and make a real mess of things, uh, in, in some cases, because uh, they have no accountability. There's no one who asks them, what are you doing, or why are you doing it this way, or saying, that this is not a good idea, uh, you're not being a good testimony for the Lord when you're carrying on certain things, so uh, there needs to be accountability. But we see here that the church did send them out, and it's also the Holy Spirit who sends them out. Well, we want to look a little more at how does this happen? What is this sending out by the Holy Spirit? Um, the other passage that is used uh, by many people today with regard to the missionary call is found in Acts chapter 16. Um, and this is where you have Paul. Paul is in Turkey, and there were places that Paul wanted to go as he's traveling, and in some way the Holy Spirit prevented him from going where he wanted to go. So in Acts 16, 6, when they had gone through Phrygia and the regions of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mycenae, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit didn't permit them. Well, how did the Holy Spirit stop them? Don't know. We're not told any specifics about that. There are things that happen in our lives, circumstances. Sometimes we use the word providence, talking about God working in a person's life to bring about circumstances so as to put that person right where God wants them to be or to produce a certain outcome. Years ago, I had been invited to go to Venezuela for two weeks. I was to go there and I was to teach uh, a missionary conference. This one mission agency brought all of their missionaries from out in the field, from out in the jungles, from all over that country. They would bring them uh, into Caracas, and they would have a, uh, a time for them to be refreshed because they needed to get out of the jungle and away from some of the stresses, and also to come together and have some fellowship with other people who spoke their native language. And uh, it was uh, something that the mission agents agency thought was important for these missionaries to have a, a time of rest and relaxation, but also a time for them to get some Bible teaching. So I had been invited to go to this conference, and I was really excited about going. I had my plane tickets. I am all prepared. I am packed. I have everything necessary. And it was the night before I was to leave we were sitting at the dinner table, 
I got a telephone call from Venezuela. And it's the man who had planned this whole big conference down there, and he said, Jim, don't come. There's been an uprising. They have imposed martial law, and by law, we can't have more than eight people or ten people assemble in one place at one time, so we're not going to be able to have this conference. So don't come. Oh, I thought, well, you know, what's a little uprising? You know, we, I, I could still go, and I can still go out to different villages, and you know, I could do something. And so I'm, I'm thinking, how, how am I going to get there now? I mean, what am I going to do? How can we work this out? And then at midnight, the airline went on strike. <laughs> so I couldn't get there if I wanted to. So I think the Holy Spirit is saying, Jim, don't go to Venezuela. So uh, th th that was providence. Okay? That, that's out of my hands. And a lot of times I'll say, you know, I like it when things are out of control because then I'm not going to make some stupid decision. I can't make any decision about this. I can't, I can't do it. So that uh, was completely out of my hands, and so obviously I did not go to Venezuela at that time. So I think uh, that's one way that the Holy Spirit can tell us don't do it. There are uh, things that happen. Of course, there are some people whose favorite song is climb every mountain. I don't care what God puts in my way. He can put a mountain there. I'm going to climb over and do what I want. Uh, well, that's not good either. All right, in verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he'd seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Well, uh, there's the Macedonian vision. People say, oh, we need to have that vision. And there's some people think they've had it or they tell the story that they've had it. So Paul had a vision, and he sees this guy over in Macedonia, which is northern central Greece. It's across the Aegean Sea from where he is, and saying, come on over. <laughs> red Rover, Red Rover, let Paul come over. Well, Paul had this vision, but God isn't speaking to us today in dreams and visions and audible voices. We have the written word of God, and we are to apply wisdom to our situation. Um, and so don't anticipate getting a Macedonian call. Any of you know that song, Send the Light? Did any of you ever sing that? You don't know that song? Oh, that... <laughs> churches I grew up in uh, sang that often, and especially if we had a missionary come through. Uh, there's a call comes ringing over the restless waves, send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, souls to save. Send the light, send the light. Well, in, in the second verse, it says this, we have heard the Macedonian call today, send the light, send the light. And a golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light. Send the light. Well, uh, we, we don't hear that Macedonian call today, even though I've heard preachers say, now maybe you heard that Macedonian call today. I want you to come forward, and I want you to dedicate your life to going to the mission field. Uh, <laughs> well, Paul's plan had been to visit and strengthen the churches in Turkey, the Asian province of Galatia. He'd gone there in his first missionary journey, his second missionary journey. He wants to go back and strengthen the churches there. Wise thing to do, have some follow-up. And then he hoped to take the gospel to unchurched regions in northern and western Turkey. Uh, but the Holy Spirit said, no, you're not going to go there. And I think one reason why, if you study the book of Acts, very interesting, Paul ended up staying one place for three years where he opened a Bible school. And there he trained people. And shortly after that, it said people throughout all that region had heard the gospel. They did much more than Paul himself could have done. 
And so from this, we get this principle of training others to go out and do the work. In this way, you multiply your efforts. So uh, we have Paul here. Uh, he gets this vision, and then he does go across the sea uh, to Greece. And so this is going to open the door now for missionary activity in Europe. And so uh, when Paul gets to Macedonia, see, he's going to go to Philippi. What happens in Philippi? Well, Paul preached these people having a prayer meeting. Woman got saved. Paul and Silas got thrown into prison, didn't they? Then you have the Philippian jailer. He gets saved along with his house. And so this gospel is going to begin to spread rapidly because the Apostle Paul um, has now gone over into, into Greece. Uh, but this Macedonian call that he had is not normative for today. And really, it was not a missionary call for the Apostle Paul. He's on his second journey. He's already a missionary, so this was not a call to go to the mission field, and so people today should not use this as um, some basis for saying God has called me to be a missionary. But uh, there are people today who still say, well, you need to have your own personal Macedonian call. So where has God called you, and how do you know? How would you know? For some people, just saying, you know, I can serve the Lord in some area. And that, they said, that's my calling. You know, my calling, yeah, it's to teach children. Did they get a special call? Did they have a vision? No. But what they did was they said yes to some opportunity, and they got involved in ministry, and then they say, that's my calling. But it wasn't that they had some supernatural experience. So don't expect to have a vision or hear a voice, but I do believe that God can still provide direction for us, even apart from direct statement in the Word of God, which we call providence. One of the people have asked me, well, tell me about your missionary call. Well, I didn't have one. And some people are shocked when I tell them that. I didn't have an experience. What I did have was about 20 years of preparation. And then an opportunity presented itself, and I said, I can do that. And I'd like to do that. I had an opportunity to go and to teach people who had not had access to the Word of God. Now, I think that God had prepared us to make this transition, and it's something that had happened gradually over a number of years. People say, how did you get to the mission field? Well, for us, it started out with a man who had... Uh, been tortured for his faith. He had been the pastor of a large church in Romania. He had been arrested by the communists. He had been tortured horribly, thrown into solitary confinement for some 10 years. He was abused all that time. And when he got out, he went back to preaching Jesus. And then he was arrested again. And they gave him a choice. You can either go back to prison or you can get out of the country. And he didn't have much opportunity for ministry when he was in prison, so he elected to leave the country. He came to America, and he traveled around, and he, he told his story about the suffering church, how Christians were persecuted behind the Iron Curtain. And he made such a strong appeal for prayer. We were very touched by this, very moved. This man was so intense. And we began praying for the church in communist Russia. 
A year or two years later, we had a young man came to our church. Uh, he had been with a, a sports team, um, the a Christian sports team that had gone into Russia. And he went in and he took some Bibles with him. And he, he told about his experience. I probably told you this story. That uh, he went to this one small city and he went to a church and they told him that in the entire city there was not one printed Bible in their language. They didn't have one. But they found out they could buy one on the black market and so all of the churches pooled their money to buy one Bible and it cost them one year's wage. What would you pay for a Bible? Think what you make in a year. Would you pay that much for a Bible? Well, that's what these churches did. They pooled their resources. They sent a man on a mission to buy a Bible. He came back with this printed Bible. And the first thing they did when they got that Bible, they took it apart page by page, one page at a time. They separated every page. And then they had people from all of the churches. They would gather, and they would sit at these tables, and they would begin to copy page by page by hand. You finish this page, you pass it down to the next person who would copy that page. And this way, each church could have its own copy of the Bible. How long would it take you to copy the Bible? I don't know. It's going to be a lot of work. You talk about writer's cramp. But they wanted the Word of God. And so <laughs> this young man said, if you will give me your handwritten copy of the Bible, I will give you a printed copy. Well, of course, a handwritten copy of the Bible has got to be so thick, and they were glad to have a printed copy, and they were glad to make that trade. And So somewhere in my archives, I have a handwritten page from the book of Acts. To me, that's just precious. But it said to me, there are people who desperately want the Word of God and they don't have access to it. At that time, it was a crime to own a Bible. They wanted the Word. Phyllis began a, a ministry of, of sending Bible portions to people behind the Iron Curtain. And uh, when Billy Graham held his big crusade in Moscow, shortly after the downfall of the Communist Party, had a great crusade in Moscow. Tens of thousands of people jammed that stadium. and We watched that every night. And people ran down onto the field. And I said, wouldn't it be wonderful to do ministry in a place where people are so hungry for the word? It wasn't long after that that a man came and said, Jim, I'm going to start a Bible school in Belarus. Will you come and help me? Where is Belarus? I had no idea. <laughs> so we looked it up on the map and uh, read a little about it. And uh, I said, well, if the Lord provides for us to go, we'll go. And a few months later, we had raised enough support that uh, we put everything we owned into storage and we got on a plane and f flew to the F Soviet Union and that's how we got there. And it, it's not that we had a special call, but I, I just had a desire to teach the Word of God and I saw those people that wanted it and I just had a desire to provide that for them. So it wasn't that I heard some voice or had some mystical experience. It's just an opportunity presented itself, and I went. Oh, if I had said no to that, would that have been sinful? I don't think so. So long as I'm making a decision that's based upon pleasing God, I could have said, no, I'm going to stay in America and continue to be a pastor. I could have done that. I don't think it would have displeased God at all. But my desire was to serve God, and I saw an opportunity to do it a different place, and that's what we did. So I think that you may get a call in this sense. Someone says, we need someone to minister in this area. Or you see an opportunity, and you say, I could do that. I could do that in ministry. And then after... 
You get involved in it, and you see that God is blessing you in that ministry, and you see that God is using you, and that you're having fruit for your labors. You say, you know, this is my calling. God called me to do this. But we don't use it in the sense that we got this up front. And I believe this is true also that God will direct us by providing us opportunities or opening doors or closing doors. Some things happen that we have to change our direction, even though we didn't plan to, didn't want to, but things happen. And now we can do something different or we must do something different. And I think God can lead us in, in these ways. So is there a separate call that's necessary in order to cross geographical or cultural barriers in order to preach the gospel or to minister to others. And I say we can't find any such thing in the Word of God. So whatever is needed to get people to the mission field, it's not referred to in Scripture as a call. So uh, what we do need Oh, is for people to be willing to serve the Lord. And sometimes you have to think about getting out of your comfort zone. But that's all right. You say, well, I might have to set aside a few things we've got here, but are they really all that important? And people begin to pray about it and begin to evaluate what's important, what's not important, and you know, what's my life worth anyway? What am I doing here? What have I accomplished? Some of the great missionary pioneers didn't know where they were going or they didn't up, end up where they thought they would go. I understand that this thing about a specific call to a specific place, that really has not worked out in experience. William Carey, known as the father of modern missions, he wanted to go to the South Seas, ended up in India, where he had just an incredible ministry. He's thousands of miles from where he thought he wanted to go. Adniram Judson, he went to India and they threw him out. <laughs> he got expelled, so he went to Burma. So he thought he was going to be in one place, ended up somewhere else. David Livingston, one of my great heroes, the great explorer, the only white man that the Zambians have any regard for in their history. David Livingston, great missionary. He wanted to go to China. <laughs> he ended up in Africa. And... Uh, also, it's interesting to read about Livingston. He was there for 25 years, and after 25 years, he couldn't look back and see any converts. He was a faithful missionary, and the Zambian people loved him. They had high regard for him. He changed the course of missions in Africa. When he got there, uh, actually... Uh, he married the boss's daughter. I mean, he went with a mission society, and uh, the head of the mission there in Zambia uh, had everyone live inside of a compound. And so the missionaries would go outside the walls during the day and talk to the natives, but then when the sun was going down, they would come back inside the walls. And they really didn't get to know the people at all. They didn't get to know their culture and uh, didn't interact with them and Livingston said, no, that's not right. How are we going to minister to these people? We have to go live among them. We have to get to know them. And uh, so he did. He, he moved out of the compound. He starts living with the people, and uh, the people had such high regard for him. He was despised by the mission agency, but the, but the Africans loved him. But uh, even though Livingston, if, if you look at the numbers of converts he'd had, you'd, you'd have to conclude he was a horrible failure. But because of Livingston's ministry, thousands of people from Britain 
went to Africa as missionaries. Thousands of missionaries went because of what Livingston did. But he started out <laughs> to go to China. He ended up in Africa and had, a, had an incredible uh, ministry there. So some of the best missionaries who have uh, ever gone out, they, they didn't start out as missionaries. Many of them started out as pastors, and then they went out to be missionaries. And then there were some who went to the mission field when they were quite young, and after they spent some years on the mission field, they came back and had great ministries as pastors. So if you get this idea about a missionary call, um, it, it would exclude most of the missionaries that we would read about. Oh, by the way, if you don't do it, I would encourage you, get some biographies of missionaries. They have some exciting stories and it, to see how God has used people and how God has uh, done some incredible things for the missionaries and through the missionaries. And it can also teach you a lot of things just about your own relationship with the Lord. Now, we do have a problem today. We've been given a commission as a, as a corporate entity, the church. But when it comes down to it, we have to have individuals who will uh, respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And if we don't have individuals going, then... The church needs to be finding a way to make it happen. How do we do that? We need to encourage people. We need to be thinking about motivating people to think about missions. Now, I, I, I grew up in different organizations where I saw a lot of manipulation. And they would get kids together at a camp and they would have some emotional appeal and they would have some missionary get up there and they, they would say, now, you know, if you're really serious about your uh, relationship with God, then if you really want God's best for your life, then you'll promise God that you're going to serve him all your life and you'll go to the mission field. And a lot of kids made promises to God that, yes, they would go to the mission field and I think most of them never went to the mission field. So it's not a matter of, uh, of trying to get you all emotional and then you're going to say, oh yes, I'll, I'll go to the mission field. But we need to get people thinking about going to the mission field and perhaps God has something for you there. And one of the things also in, in considering missions, you don't have to consider it as a lifetime commitment, a lifetime occupation. Now, I think there are some who are going to be career missionaries. But some missionaries, they'll go and after 20 years or 25 years living out in a jungle or a very hostile environment, they find they have health problems. I think of somebody like Brett and Wand and Asworth. I mean, they, they were there in Venezuela out in the jungle, and, and they had all kinds of health problems with diseases and different things, and they had to come home. They're still serving the Lord, but it's in a different way now. I think that we need people to say, you know, I could do this, and I'm willing to do it if God gives me opportunity, and you can use your spiritual gift in some way uh, to bring the gospel to people who don't have the opportunity to do it. Um, Matthew 9, 37, 38, Jesus said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We don't have too many laborers today. And the number is dwindling. We have fewer and fewer people from the church in America who are going to the mission field. And we need to think about that. What's going on? I, I believe that uh, also being a missionary is being patriotic. 
One reason God has spared America is because we continue to be today the number one sending nation in all of the world. And if America goes down, who's going to support those missionaries? So it's very patriotic to support your missionaries. But the number of missionaries in the world, if you look at the missiologists in their report, they say, oh, no, we have as many missionaries today as we, as we did 40 years ago. Well, that's true if you want to look at the number of missionaries in the world, but those from America, that number is dwindling rapidly. We have a lot of missionary growth, uh, missionaries going out, but many of them are from Oriental countries, from Korea. Most of them are Pentecostal, charismatic. You have a lot of Chinese missionaries. Amazing. They don't know much about the Word of God because they haven't been taught, but boy, they will make a commitment to Jesus. And they say, I've given my body to Jesus. You can do with it what you want. And they'll go out, and they're going to talk about Jesus. We need to think about the fact that the laborers are few. Are we praying for the Lord to send laborers into his field? We, we ought to do that. We need to have people from this church think about missions. Maybe the Lord wants me to go. So what am I going to have to do? How am I going to prepare? How am I going to get there? So I believe the church has a responsibility to find out why after some 19 centuries we still have so few laborers. Well, how to know if God is calling you to be a missionary? Well, it might be just a matter of you saying, I could do that. And you have an opportunity. You see an open door. You investigate the possibilities. How could I possibly serve the Lord? There are a lot of different ways that this can be done on the mission field with a lot of different gifts. There's no one spiritual gift. I don't think missionary is a spiritual gift. I don't believe I have a spiritual gift to be a missionary. I'm a Bible teacher, and uh, I can do that in a lot of different places, but I've uh, chosen to do this on the mission field, and I've been very happy doing that. I love doing it. I want to continue doing it. But maybe you're saying, I could go do something. I could serve the Lord and spread the word of, of the gospel in other places. All right. Um, we'll stop here tonight. But I pray that the Lord will speak to you about these things. And maybe you're not going to go to the mission field, but maybe you can encourage someone else. Maybe you see somebody else. And they show interest. They say things. They do things. And you notice, say, that person could be a missionary. Maybe what they need is for you to spark their interest, just to acknowledge, hey, I see what you do. Do you ever think about the mission field? And you might be the catalyst. You might be the motivation for someone to consider being a missionary. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for your patience with us. You put up with us. We fall short in so many ways. And yet we're still here because you still have a purpose for us. So I pray that we might focus on fulfilling that purpose. May we come to understand clearly how we ought to live so that we might be pleasing to you in all respects. And I pray, too, that we're going to consider how we can best serve you, whether it's going, whether it's staying. We do pray, Father, that you're going to send laborers into the harvest, maybe even from this church, that people might realize you have a call on their life, 
the sense that you want them to be faithful, to use their gifts to glorify you. So I just pray that your spirit would uh, take the word and use it to uh, jog our thinking. We might consider how we can best use the time that you've given to us to bring you glory. So again, we thank you for the freedom we have to come together. Pray that you continue to watch over and care for us. Keep us free in this nation. And Father, I pray that you'll show us mercy as we go to our homes tonight. Take us safely there and give us grace that we can come again to worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.